Greetings all and welcome to Gender Matters with me, Elizabeth Hobson and Mike Buchanan from Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them and our esteemed guest for today, Tom Golden. Tom is a therapist with 30 plus years of experience working with men and boys as well as women and girls who maintains a practice in Gaithersburg, Maryland, as well as conducting consultations online. Tom is well known in the field of healing from loss, having traveled right around the world to share his wisdom and having been named the 1999 International Grief Educator by the Australian Centre for Grief Education. Tom built the first interactive website for bereaved people in 1995, webhealing.com. The page houses the internet's first memorial site, a place to honor grief. He has also worked as the vice chairman of the Maryland Commission for Men's Health. He featured in the Red Pill documentary and he participates in weekly discussions with Paul Elam and Janice Fiamengo on the YouTube series regarding men. He has written three excellent books, The Way Men Heal, Helping Mothers Be Closer to Their Sons, and Swallowed by a Snake, The Gift of the Masculine Side of Healing, all available on Amazon. And his work has been featured on the CBS Evening News, ESPN, the NFL Channel, the New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. His website is Men Are Good, and you can find him at TR Golden on Twitter. All the links will be in the description. Tom, welcome to Gender Matters. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's good to be here. It's an honor to be here. And, you know, as I listened to that introduction, it, it struck me that, you know, almost all of that media attention that I got was before the media figured out that I really loved men. <laughs> you know, it was like it was at the time in my career when I was starting to write about men, but they, they hadn't gotten the message yet that I really loved men, that I liked men, that I thought that men were good the way they were, you know, because they, you get a whole lot more attention. Warren Farrell and I have talked about this a lot, you know, about how if he had focused on women, he would be in a completely different place today. And I think the same is true for me. And as soon as the media hears that you really do care about men, um, you're on the outskies. You know, so it's just interesting to point out. Okay. Th thanks, Tom. Tom, I've been a, a big fan of your work since you gave your talk at the first International Conference on Men's Issues in Detroit in 2014. We'll put links to your ICMI videos in the video description. I think your, your Regarding Men video series, now well into its second year, is the gold standard of such videos. The chemistry between you, Paul Elam, and Professor Janice Fiamengo is a wonderful thing to see. I also admire a series of occasional videos featuring Paul E. Lamb and yourself. <clears throat> now, Elizabeth is way too much of a lady to name it in her introduction, so I will. <laughs> it's the gloriously well-named series with the title, You Can't Make This Shit Up. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think you've published 16 episodes now, Tom. And, Something and, like that. Yeah, and they're all very well worth catching. And laugh out loud funny um, so many times in every episode. Tom, you've had some very, very interesting things to say recently about the role that testosterone plays in men's and boys' lives. Um, can you take us uh, through your thinking in that area? Yeah, you know, it's so critical, Mike. Testosterone is so, so central to what happens with men. And we almost hear nothing about it from the media. And there have been some amazing research studies done on testosterone in the last 10, 15 years that never hit the media. You never, people never hear about it. It's not in schools, it's not in newspapers, it's not any place. So it's really uh, incumbent upon us to kind of get that message out there because people don't know that men and boys go through three floods of testosterone. You know, not just one at 13, but there's three floods. The first flood is in utero. You know, when, when you're, you're like, what was it, 20 weeks in utero, 15 to 20 weeks in utero, and you're the size of a little nut you know, and your brain gets flooded with testosterone. This changes the boys from that point forward in a dramatic sort of way. And people don't know about this. Changes your, it impacts your sexual orientation. It impacts your gender identity. It impacts the way you play with others. And it impacts your aggressiveness. So all of these things they know, now, and there's lots of other things that it does, but they know that those four are certainly impacted by that testosterone flood. 
And there's so many other things about it. You know, the whole systems oriented brain that uh, Simon Baron Cohen mm -hmm. uh, went into where he found that those people who had this flood tended to think more in terms of systems. You know, whereas the people who did not have the flood mm -hmm. didn't think in terms of systems. They thought more in terms of uh, relations, relationship, you know. So there's all kinds of things out there that we don't know. And, uh, you know, then you know, the, the next flood is the mini puberty, you know, where we found now that little boys, right as they're born, have this flood of testosterone from the first day you're born until about, I think, two months later, something like that. And they still don't know exactly what that one does. I mean, they're thinking that it, it uh, further enhances the um, developmental stuff for males, but I don't think they've really come to conclusions yet. Um, but we do know that little boys, little infant boys, any parent who's had a little baby boy knows that right about the time that he's born, he gets these little erections, bing! You know, the penis just sticks straight up. That's that testosterone flood. You know, it's flooding him with testosterone and his penis responds accordingly. And, and then of course the last flood is when, you know, the, the real testosterone kind of hits the fan. And, uh, you know, they always thought, oh yeah, testosterone is this terrible thing. You know, Alan Alda with the testosterone poisoning stuff and the, you know, this testosterone creates violence and aggression. And now in the last 15 to 10 to 15 years, they've come to realize the testosterone's not about aggression. It's not about violence. It's about striving for status. Striving for status. We as males want to succeed. We want to come up higher and higher in this male hierarchy that we live in. And the testosterone is the fuel to make that happen. This is so critical to understand about men. If you don't understand that, you can't understand men and boys. You know, if you don't understand that they've got this juice inside them that makes them want to strive for status, strive for status, strive for status, and it does all kinds of other things too. But that's that's kind of the big scoop on testosterone, the, the uh, a short scoop on testosterone. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, Simon Baron Cohen, of course, is famous, um, for, you know, for his work on on uh, well on, on gendered brain differences, I guess. Yes, um, and um, the feminist denial of gender typical brain differences becomes more <laughs> absurd. Well, it's been absurd for thirty years, but it just gets more and more absurd with every passing year. And I, I know Baron Cohen did some tests with, um, I, I suppose you'd still call them babies, really. Um, at, at, at just I think a couple of weeks old. I, I might be wrong, but around that, um, and, and found that the the female babies were drawn and were interested in faces, uh, or most of them. Um, yes. Where, where, whereas the males were interested in mechanical things and yes. uh, trucks and, and so on. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think you said in one of your videos that the same has been shown in um, in some primates. In yes. Young primates. So I mean, I mean, unless you want to say that that two week old babies have been socialized by the patriarchy, <laughs> I guess um, that would be in the realm of feminist theorizing. Anyway, I've, I've, I've said enough. Um, uh, it's so true, though. You unless know, they... it's over to you. I, I, I was um, interested, I've never read it anywhere, before, but it's in your book, Helping Mothers Be Close to Their Sons, where you say that um, the testosterone flood in utero happens to, was it 70% of boys? And, or was it 75, sorry? I forget what the percentage is. I don't think they even know exactly mm. what the percentage is, but we know that yeah. most boys get this flood, some don't, and some mm. girls get this flood. Mm -hmm. Uh, or not, maybe not yeah. the same flood, but something and similar. And the girls are more. And the girls yeah. are more masculine. You know, we call and they have those this girls tomboys. We call those girls feminists. <laughs> no, actually, that's not true. We call those <laughs> girls tomboys, and they're actually more masculine. You know, and they're much more likely to understand men in a different kind of way than the uh, more typical feminine ways of looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. So Elizabeth, mm -hmm. your first question, I think. If you, yeah, yeah. So if you don't mind, Tom, for the first of my three questions, I'd like you to take us on a little trip back through time. So I emailed you a long time ago expressing excitement at an amendment brought forward to the US Congress 
by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, of all people, to facilitate the study of psychedelic drugs for sufferers of treatment-resistant depression and PTSD, which was subsequently rejected, unfortunately. But your response to that email I sent blew my mind. You told me that you were involved in a study when you were a psychiatric technician back in 1974 run by your hero, Stan Groff, mm. that took patients who were literally hopeless, put them on a comfy chair, played soothing music through headphones, covered their eyes with a soft mask, and then injected them intravenously with LSD. Yes. And his success rate was astounding. People went through transformations that were life-changing. So I'd really love to hear about your early days in psychiatry and what you think we can learn from Groff's work and the other pioneering work that was going on at that time. Yeah, what a, what a fascinating thing to have seen. You know, I was so lucky to have been there. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And it was literally amazing. I mean, what they did was with Groff's study, they took the worst people the people who, who the therapist thought could never, ever get better. I mean, they took the worst of them. And the people that went to him, I think it was like 60% got better. They'd go through these experiences, these transformative experiences with the LSD that would move them in such a way that they broke out of this depression. They broke out of whatever psychiatric problems they were involved with. And it was literally amazing what he was doing. And then, of course, what happened shortly after he started this, these studies, uh, the United States banned the use of LSD. Because before that, Sandoz, a drug company, used to make LSD and put it out on the market. There were these orange, orange barrels, actually, you know, that uh, came straight from the drug company that was straight pure lysergic LSD-25, you know, so it was... Uh, an interesting time, but the U.S. banned it. They threw it out altogether. So what did Groff do? He was trying to find something that would mimic LSD, that would have the same kind of, of reaction to LSD, and he searched and searched and searched, and finally he found that the breath had that same sort of capacity. And that's where he founded holotropic breathwork, which is a pattern of breathing that you go through as you're listening to very loud music and you have someone who is your steward as you're kind of there you're being stewarded and you go through a very transformative experience just by using the breath so i fell in love with groff you know he has just been uh, over the years just been a fascinating man and luckily i was uh, he and i spoke at the same conference and uh, we had lunch together so that was a really special time for me because i love this guy I mean, he's just a pioneer and, and a fascinating man and not afraid to try different things, you know, which is what we need. And it's what we're lacking in today's world. I mean, the, the whole culture today is more a lockdown. Don't try anything different. You know, don't, don't be bold. Don't go out and do something wild. It's like, oh, no, you can't do that. So we're almost strapped in now, you know. It feels like, like that's crazy, crazy stuff. So, yeah, Stan Groff, I love Stan Groff. He and his wife, uh, Christina Hoff, uh, Christina Hoff, Christina Groff um, wrote a number of books, but one that, it, that they wrote was on psychiatric emergencies. Because what they found was that in many psychiatric emergencies, there is um, something that they called a uh, spiritual awakening. So sometimes a spiritual experience can mimic the very same symptoms that happen in a psychiatric emergency, right? And so they have this little book, it's, it's about yay thick, and it's a paperback, it's about like that, that's wonderful, that helps you look at how can you tell the difference, you know, between a psychiatric emergency and a spiritual emergence. Because what the terrible thing is that sometimes people go through these spiritual emergences, and they end up in the emergency room, and they just pump all the psych drugs in them, and everything gets numbed out, and people then go nuts from the psych meds, you know? Anyway, we're way off topic, so yeah. we're going to get back to gender mm. stuff. I, I, have, I, have a, I have a friend, Tom, who's um, got, got, got uh, he's, in his, he's a man in his 30s, he has some, some quite severe psychiatric problems, but uh, um, he was recently sectioned, you know, I don't know if you have the same word in the States, but, but uh, 
you know, he was he was taken into to to a mental hospital, and um, and he came, he came back a few days later, and he's one of these guys who can find humour in in some things, so it, it it amused him. He laughed out loud when he was telling me that um, there was a, a man there who believed he was Jesus, and one who believed he was Muhammad, and apparently they didn't get on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, as for the two Napoleons, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, let, okay, question, uh, my, my, my second question, let me just go back. What you got? Okay, Tom, I'd like to ask a question about narcissism. My, oh. my provisional talk title for this year's International Conference on Men's Issues, which we'll be announcing in maybe two weeks, is this. Pandering to female narcissism is destroying civilization. I'm 62, and my personal experience um, has been that far more women than men are narcissists, narcissi narcissistic. And Elizabeth, who's half my age, says her personal experience is the same. Yet I understand that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, commonly known as DSM-5, states that male, na male narcissism is more common than female narcissism. Can you give us your thoughts on this apparent paradox? Yeah, well, it's a uh, it's an interesting problem, and one that I've noticed also. And I tend to agree with both you and Elizabeth that my experience is that women tend to be more narcissistic than men. Um, however, I think there's a reason why they think this, and the reason is that men live in a hierarchy, and men have this testosterone stuff that says strive for status, strive for status, and it also says. Try and make yourself appear independent at all costs. And what that does is, that means men are more likely to want to inflate their appearance in any kind of place. And this can be, I mean, it, obviously men do this for good reason, because they want to go up in the hierarchy, you know? But I think it gets misinterpreted sometimes as being narcissistic, when that's probably not it at all. You know, it's something else altogether. So that's my guess is that it has to do with um, misnaming uh, men's hierarchical stuff. Because, you know, the, the psychological community knows nothing about the male hierarchy. Mm. Zero. You know, okay. and we've got now this whole thing where we understand there's three areas of research that go into our understanding of how and why this hierarchy exists. And the first one we've talked about a little bit already, that's the testosterone. Is, is fuels this hierarchy. It makes men want to achieve and want to get up there and to do better and whatever. And of course, that's a part of the masculine way. And it's what's built the daggone world. You know, if we didn't have this testosterone stuff, if men didn't try and be inflated, if men didn't try and be better than the next guy, we'd be living in grass huts. You know? Well, uh, was it Camille Paglia who said that Yes. If, if women had been responsible, responsible for civilization, we'd all be living in caves. But yes. The, but, the cushions in fact, be, but, uh, but the cushions would be amazing. <laughs> I think that I stole the grass huts directly from her. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the idea. Yeah. But men get misinterpreted all the time. People do not understand men. They do not understand that men have this hierarchical thing going on. And they but misinterpret it. Oh, sorry, sorry. You, you, I, I watched the other day again your 2014 uh, uh, speech, and um, I, I was struck I was struck by, by 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 one of the points you made that when you le I don't know if it was when you left university for your first professional job, um, <laughs> there were 16 or 17 therapists and you were the only man. Yes, and I, I know certainly in the UK uh, psychology more than 90 um, percent. I think it might even be closer to 95 percent of psychology students are female. So it's, 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 it's hardly surprising that, you know, some of the stuff that comes out of that reality, I don't think. Yes. And they've all been influenced by the feminist claptrap that comes out of the media. Yeah. That you better believe it. If you don't believe it, you're, you know, not going to be accepted. And so, you know, even the male psychologists today, if you go to the Division 51, you see that they're all pro-feminists. You know, they're all thinking... You know, we owe feminists and we, we need to be more like women. I mean, that's literally what this one guy said in Division 51. A very famous psychologist said, men need to learn to be more like women. And when they do, the world will be a better place. And John, John, Barry, John Barry, a psychologist, Irish psychologist who lives in London, um, it, it took him years to have 
the British, uh, sorry, what is it? The men's, I, I can't remember what it's called, Elizabeth. I don't know if you remember the, 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 the sort of special interest groups for, for- Oh, oh well, it's the British Psychological Society and it's called the Male Psychology Section, isn't right. it? Yes, I think that's right. Something and, like that. And, and, and uh, he finally got it through after some years of trying. Uh, but uh, yeah. no, a really quite extraordinary, well, not extraordinary to us, but to maybe most people, the number of votes against it were really, you know, right. they're kind of what right. you expect, really, I suppose. But uh, yes, yeah, yeah, he's another hero, man. He he really yeah. put his yeah. neck out there. He made it happen, so he gets yeah. kudos. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. job, John. Yeah. Cheers to that. Yeah. Cheers to that. <laughs> but, you know, the whole narcissism piece is an interesting one, Mike. That we could talk a little bit more about if you want to. Yes, yes. Um, because well, I, I think I think it drives so much. I think it's a major it, driver of feminism. Yes, and it drives our culture. You know, they talk about the uh, what's the OIC, the overly indulged children. Mm. Have you heard about that? No, no. Well, there's been research on this. You know, where they look at the research of what they call overly indulged children, and there's three factors they talk about, and this, these are all things that have picked up pace in the past twenty to thirty years. One is these children are given too many things, presents, too many presents, too many toys, too many this, too many that. They are um, over-nurtured. Oh, you're wonderful. They never get criticism. Over-nurtured all the time, you know, too much of loving this and too much of loving that and never said you need to, you know, clean up your room, right? And then the third thing is they live in a soft structure, you know, where these kids never get limits and that kind of sums up what we've got today in a lot of ways from both the boys and the girls they have lived in environments like this where they've never really because without fathers the families lose that capacity to set the limits you know, it's the dads who can really come in and set limits usually now sometimes it's the other way around but usually it's the dads and they've done the research and they now know what kind of qualities these children have as adults when they are experienced this sort of upbringing. You know what they are? <laughs> they're excessive, they're self-centered, they're obnoxious, and they're ill-tempered. <laughs> Does that yeah. make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've noticed uh, throughout my life that, that, um, that, that, that mothers more than fathers, and especially single mothers, I have to say, uh, yep spend a lot of time trying to be friends with their children rather yes. than being parents. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the, I mean, they the, the, the sort of, um, the, uh, I, I remember, um, gosh, it must be nearly 10 years ago now, um, I, I had a debate with Julie Bindle at Durham University. And, um, and, and uh, af um, afterwards, um, may maybe seven or eight feminists came up to the bar, there was a free bar afterwards, and said, you know, really enjoyed that. I don't agree with you, but and all all six or seven, Tom volunteered that they were the um, that they were the offspring of single mothers. Yes. All, yes. Every single one of them. Yes. I mean, I mean, you know, so the the, the destruction of the nuclear family. One of the, one of the things it does is to deliver troops, feminist troops, doesn't it? Yep. Exactly. You know, the, they've done research now on um, fatherlessness, and we know that. 40% of the kids in the United States do not live with their natural father. And they've also done some research on college students where they gave them this, this index to try and survey them to see how narcissistic they were. And in 1975, I think it was, they did the same survey with the same age students, same college age students, and they came up with these results but today's results in 2018, I think it was done, are 40% higher. In other words, 40% less compassionate than, than 30, 40 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, we have literally lost compassion in our culture. And I think a big part of it is there's no fathers because we know now that it's the fathers that teach compassion. You know, we know the fathers teach compassion because the fathers set the limits. And without limits, the kids don't learn compassion. Why? Because the kid says, I want ice cream. Daddy says, nope, no ice cream till you eat your broccoli. No, 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 
ice cream. Nope, no ice cream till you eat your broccoli. This goes on for you know five minutes till finally the kid gives in and says, okay, they eat the broccoli and then they have the ice cream. What happened there? The kid had to learn to see the world through someone else's eyes. They had to learn to see the world through the father's eyes. That is the rudiment of being able to be compassionate for others is to be able to see the world through others' eyes. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? Fathers are so critical and so important, and we've done them terrible by yanking them from homes, from the children that they love and the children that love them. It's just amazingly stupid what we've done. So, so I mean, I guess it makes sense then that fatherlessness would tend to drive narcissistic personality disorder. Exactly, and, exactly. Uh, you know, um, and so, so certainly, I, I mean, someone did a study once of prominent feminists and not one, not one of them had a healthy relationship with the father. Oh, God. Yeah, sad but true. Sad but true. Elizabeth, is it, I can't, is it your turn for a question or mine? I can't remember which it is now. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, so, I would like to explore the thesis of precarious manhood that Ooh. describes manhood as something hard won and easily lost. I find it to be a valid theory, and it grieves me that men's identity is subject to such unforgiving social standards. I'd like you to explain exactly what precarious manhood is, um, whether you think standards have changed or are changing at all. And actually, based on what Janice Fiamengo was saying last week about women's lack of a clear pathway to being a good woman, mm. whether there actually is any utility in it, even if it's limited. Okay. You know, precarious manhood is probably the second piece of understanding male hierarchy. And it's research driven. It's been going on for 10, 15 years. Vandello is the main researcher in all of this. And They've come up with some ideas. Now, the precarious manhood states that basically um, men and boys after their adolescence are judged as whether they're men or not. And this judgment is not just in Western cultures, it's all around the world. Men and boys get judged as to whether they are men. This is very different from girls who are never judged as whether they're women. I mean, girls, they call it an ascribed status, you know, where the girls become women as soon as they have their first period, you know. Oh, she's a woman now, you know. Oh, goody, goody. But there's no, oh, he's a man now. He's got to prove it. He's got to prove it. And mm -hmm. the fascinating thing is that all over the world, it's the same way. You know, and what does this do? Here we've got these young men who are getting testosterone that says strive for status. And they're thrown into this vat that says, everyone's gonna judge you to see whether you're a man or not. And this is not, this is not a once a month kind of judgment. This is every stinking day. Anyway, so Vandello came up with three basic ideas about what it is and kind of summarize it. And the first one was, uh, manhood is widely viewed as an elusive achieved status, not ascribed, but achieved, or one that must be earned in contrast of womanhood, which is an ascribed or assigned status. So you gotta achieve it, you gotta prove it every stinking day. Now think about it. This is a very different world that boys live in, that girls live in. I do not think that most women can even come close to understanding what it's like to live in a world where you have to prove every day that you are your gender, you know? And I don't think the boys and men can understand what it's like to just be a woman and to not have to prove anything. And you know, we see all the time how this plays out. Women go, oh, why can't you just talk about your feelings in public? What's wrong with you? You can't, you can't emote. What's wrong with you? Well, honey, guess what? If he emotes in public, his, his status goes down like a rock. Everyone will, oh, you know, because a man's pain is taboo. No one wants to touch that crap, right? And so this is the whole thing about precarious manhood is that it has implications on what happens to men, the way we live our lives. We want to, because of testosterone, we want to appear higher in the hierarchy. And now because of precarious manhood, we're forced into a scenario where we have to prove ourselves. How many times have you heard women say, why does he have to always prove himself? 
Well, honey, this is why. <laughs> this is why he has to prove himself. The second thing Mandela said was, once achieved, um, once achieved, man would, manhood status is tenuous and impermanent. So that is, it can be lost or taken away. So it's easy to lose, but hard to gain. Men know this. Men know this. And that's why they're very careful not to do things in public that will make them look anything less than independent. Because independent is the key word. A man who's independent, who no one tells him what to do, that's a man who's high on the hierarchy. Anytime you have someone tell you what to do, you drop down. Think about asking for directions. Men don't like to ask for directions, right? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Because if you ask for directions, it means you don't know where you're going. <laughs> and in the hierarchy, you drop way down. You know, also, you're dependent upon someone else to tell you what to do. Men don't want to do this. God, I'll never forget the, uh, who was that wrote that book? Deborah Tannen wrote the book about the uh, linguist stuff. And she said, one time there was a guy who was his first solo flight. He had just learned how to fly. His first solo flight he couldn't find where the airport was. And instead of phoning in and saying, where's the airport? He landed in a cornfield. <laughs> and that is precarious manhood. That is testosterone right there. He did not want to admit that he didn't know where he was going. So precarious manhood really has an impact on all kinds of factors about the way men are. You know, men are good, but we don't understand them. We don't have a clue. The third thing Vandela said was manhood is confirmed primarily by others and thus requires public demonstrations of proof. You've got to prove it in public. You've got to show people in public that you're a, quote, man. And again, this confounds women because they don't understand why a man would need to prove something. You know, the thing about testosterone is that testosterone gives men this thing called threat vigilance. Threat vigilance, which is mm -hmm. this threat vigilance says, if someone challenges your status, you better respond to that. You better challenge them back. You know, don't let anyone get away with challenging your status. That's in your blood, guys. That's in your testosterone, right? And so this is why in bars, when people get, men are drinking, they lose some of their capacity and someone challenges another man, he's challenging his status. And the man's testosterone says, don't allow someone to challenge your status. And so it just goes like this up out of control, you know, especially if you have people who have been drinking, people who have low IQ, you know, and people who are maybe mentally uh, troubled, you know, all of those things are under high degree of stress, boom, it just comes out and it's an, an understandable consequence of our, our biology and this precarious manhood thing, not that we need to condone it or approve it, but we can understand it better when we understand precarious manhood. Right, interesting. Tom, I've been very impressed by um, some of your recent videos on an issue that you term moral typecasting. And I wondered if you could tell us something about that issue. You guys are hitting them one, two, three, because you know the, the testosterone and the precarious manhood are what we've talked about so far that sort of mold the situation for men. But this thing called moral typecasting, Mike, is more recent. Um, and it has to do with our hierarchy also. And here's the deal. A guy named Gray did some research a while back on what he termed was moral typecasting. And what he found was that um, when we see moral situations, we tend to automatically see it as a dyad where one person is what they call has patiency and one person has agency. And the agency person is the one who is strong, who's getting things done or is the perpetrator, right? And the patiency is the victim or the one who's having things done to them. And he said, this is a solid kind of effect that goes on and on and on so that people automatically see things like that. And he said that the two are not mutually exclusive. So once you're labeled as having agency, you're probably not gonna be seen as being a victim. And once you are seen as having patience, you're not gonna be seen as having agency, right? Well, that was all well and good. And then they came to another conclusion just recently. Um, what is her name? Tanya, Tanya, um, Rendles. 
Thank you. She came up with the idea, idea of studying, okay, moral typecasting, that makes sense, but are men more likely to be seen as one or the other and are women? Oh, ho, ho, ho. so what she found was people automatically see men as having agency and they automatically see women as having patience. And that starts to explain all of so many different things. It explains feminism. Mm. Because feminism is riding on the current of moral typecasting. Because people automatically assume that women are in need, that women deserve services, that women are victims, right? But and the problem is that when people see someone with agency or men, they do not think he has, has any kind of need. They don't think he deserves services. And they see him as the problem. In fact, you know, with women, it's so strong now, what, what Tanya Reynolds found was that it's so strong in women that even when she's the perpetrator, she is seen as, um, as having, um, being a victim, right? So when women are perpetrators, what do people do? They think, oh, she was abused as a child, or oh, she, she's got mental illness. When men have the same kinds of behaviors as that, do they get that kind of understanding? No, they throw them in the jail. No, that's it. But see, you see how it works? I mean, one sex is given a pass, is given a pass to be a victim and they need services and they need this and that, and the other sex is not. You see that all the time in the courts, Tom, where um, women have done all, I mean, right up to murder. Um, where, you know, where, up to murder. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, murder. that's a particular, it, particular yeah, because they will say they're being abused. They were abused, they were terrified. Battered wife syndrome, there's, there's no battered husband syndrome, of course. Um, uh, and and um, it will just be accepted. And suddenly they become the victim again. Yeah. Even though they murdered him. <laughs> and, and, and we saw that we saw that with Johnny Depp, of course, didn't we? Yes, we yeah. sure did. Uh, you know, Amber Heard said, you know, you, why did you make me hit you? It yes. Really quite, quite extraordinary. But to, to, to and, and she also said something else, Mike, which is important. She said, well, you can go ahead and tell the world that I, I beat you, but no one's going to believe you. She knew the power of moral typecasting. He absolutely did. She knew that no one would believe him. Mike, you know, for years I did this work with people who are grieving, and it's so clear. Everyone wants to help the woman. Mm. But the man, what do they say to the man? How's your wife doing? <laughs> you know? How's your wife holding up? Yeah. Literally. I mean, literally. So men have grown used to not having this kind of support, and they've found different ways to, to handle themselves, which is yeah. fine. That's okay. You know, I, I, I found Tanya Reynolds' uh, work very, oh. very interesting. And I, oh. think, I think she spoke, Elizabeth, didn't she, at the last, you know, the, the sort of the men's section of the British Psychological Society? Yes, yes, she did. Yeah, the male psychology conference. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. One, of the, one of the things that makes me smile whenever I think of it was a study where she showed those kind of like cartoony thing where, where the, the, there's a situation where one triangle of a certain color was, was attacking another triangle. Right. Um, and, and so... We're just locked into it. Right. So, sorry, sorry, Elizabeth, can you repeat that? Mm. I said the triangle, well, one triangle's stationary and the other triangle just comes over and bumps it. Right. And then Tanya would say, this triangle is a woman, what's just happened? And people would say, oh, she's just bumped into that other triangle. And then she would say, this triangle's a man what's just happened and people would say oh he's just pushed that person yes. you know it's yes. that kind of thing even triangles mm. <laughs> yep even triangles extraordinary yes but thanks tom that very interesting um elizabeth back to you i think right yeah well finally it would seem churlish to have an expert healing from grief on the show during a global pandemic and indeed at a time when two men that I know have recently lost parents. Mm. So would you, Tom, share with us a snippet of good advice for dealing with bereavement? Hmm. Good advice for dealing with bereavement. You know, I would give different advice to men and to women. And to women, I would say, talk about it. You know, do what you can to interact. Because in the years of working with men and women, I found that women much prefer interaction as a mode to heal, and which is fine. It's a great way to heal, and it works. 
It's just one way to tell one story. And sadly, in today's world, you know, like the Division 51 people, people expect men to talk about it too. That's not their nature. And we now can see from precarious manhood and from testosterone that he's less likely to talk about it. You know, the other thing we didn't talk about with testosterone is that testosterone tends to mute emotions, it tends to mute them, so that when the man is in the midst of a crisis, he really can't articulate the emotion in the same way that a woman can because of his testosterone. We know that from all kinds of places, but importantly from the trans men biological women who've taken huge doses of testosterone and they've said, wait a minute, I can no longer articulate my feelings when I'm in the midst of feeling them. So you, you take a man and a woman, you pull them into a therapist's office. They're obviously both stressed, right? And you say to the woman, what are you feeling? She'll go, oh, ba-dee, 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 ba-dee. and she'll talk about it. And you say to the guy, well, what are you feeling? <laughs> uh, right? Why? It's not, and she goes, he never wants to talk about it. He doesn't care, you know, <laughs> whatever. But really, it's because the guy, is, his testosterone is wiping out his, his capacity to articulate it. If you give that guy a couple of hours, he could come back and, and work with it and deal with it. Anyway, so men and women are different in the way we deal with things. And the women, I'd say, talk about it. But for the guys, I'd say, think about what you do about it. Because men are much more likely to do something in honor of their loss that no one sees, no one understands as being connected to their loss, but they tell their story through the doing, through their doing, not through their talking. You know, an example is Eric Clapton, and you know his son was killed falling out of the building, and what did Clapton do after the son died? You know, he basically, pulled back and he went to AA meetings and he played guitar and he played the guitar over and over and over again until three songs started to manifest, right? Three beautiful songs came out of this. He, he called it his waking nightmare, you know, this waking nightmare. But he said, he, he said it was the guitar that was his salvation, you know? So it was his doing, his playing that guitar, his using his strength of music to connect in with those emotions. Because every time he's playing that song, he's writing songs about his son, right? Every time he's thinking of words and playing that song, he's with his son. He's with his grief in the same way that a woman might be with it if she was talking about it, but he's playing. And the three songs that came out, the one people most, most people know about is the uh, Tears in Heaven song, which is about, you know, will we meet again kind of thing. Another very powerful song was My Father's Eyes, where he was thanking his son for giving him the opportunity to see his father's eyes through his son's eyes, because I don't think he'd ever met his father before. I forget exactly how that worked, something like that. And then the third song was literally about his grief. It's called When the Circus Left Town. And apparently the night before his son died, Clapton took his son to the circus. And the song is about how that one time to the circus will have to last him for his life and for the rest. And boy, if you can listen to that song without a tear coming to your eye, you're a rock. You're a piece of grant. Just a beautiful, beautiful song. I've seen it. There's a YouTube of him playing it and, and singing to it. I cannot believe the guy can play it without crying. And it's just such a powerful song. Can you see how it was what he did that connected him in with his story in the same way that women will connect in by talking about it. Both ways are very powerful, but the man's way is not known. And too many times people will say, there's something wrong with him. He hasn't said one thing and he doesn't cry. He doesn't cry. Guess what else testosterone does, boys and girls? Oh my God, testosterone dries up tears. So I can remember when I was 10 years old, I could cry and cry. I used to follow the Washington sports teams. They lost all the time. I'd be crying like a banshee, right? 13 years old, I stopped crying. I always thought later in grad school, I was trying to be a tough guy, you know, I won't cry, blah, 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 but that's not it at all. Once the testosterone came up, my capacity to cry went down. And we know this from a lot of reasons, but if you study the trans men, and I did a video with two trans men, um, it's a fascinating video, talk, them talking about this whole experience. It's fascinating hearing them talk about what happened to their emotions when they started taking testosterone. But what they found was that their tears dried up. 
they dried up. So when women say, he never cries, guess what, ladies? It's not because he doesn't feel something. He feels it probably very similar to the way you do, but he doesn't have the tears to go with it. I, I like to ask women sometimes, I say, imagine what it would be like if you had the same feeling, but you couldn't cry. And they all go, oh, God. And they start to realize, holy crap, maybe he is in a difficult spot, you know? Because we need to understand that men are different and men are good. And the more we can understand what drives them, what makes them tick, what testosterone is about, what precarious manhood is about, what moral typecasting is about, the more we can love them for who they are, you know, rather than throwing them out because they're not like women. So, Tom, I, um, I just, I, I've got the, uh, the short final question, but, but before I do, you, one of the things that makes you unique is that you own um, an alarm clock with four legs called Barney. <laughs> Like, Come here, you, you, said, you said just as we were chatting before this video that he would come over at a certain point. I, yeah, he, I, I think personally you have some electronic device that prompts him. Well, I wish I did yesterday, but uh, what can you say? Just okay. full I, disclosure, I forgot all about our meeting yesterday and Barney didn't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, if you owned a cat, I mean, you'd, you'd have been okay. But there it we go. would not have worked. It wouldn't have worked. No, Barney's a good boy. Okay, just, just a final quick one, Tom. Um, yeah. Interested in your um, points about gender differences in dealing with grief, I'd also like something that interested has interested me um, very much since I wrote a book about marriage about eleven years ago called "The Fraud of the Rings," and, uh, <laughs> and, and um, inspired by my second uh, ill fate. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy, by the way. I uh, should read it. Yeah, because I mean, uh, William Collins's book is on the way to you. Oh uh, boy, I can't wait to see that. Um, but um, as, as you know, about 50% of people are introverts and 50% uh, extroverts. Depending. And, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite extreme introvert. And uh, an no. extrovert who should remain nameless said to me, oh, don't put yourself down. <laughs> <laughs> and fr frankly, if you really understand introversion and extroversion, and I spend a lot of the time studying it, I'd much rather be, be an introvert than an extrovert. But anyway, but, 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 but my question is, um, I, I would have thought that there are differences in how you would advise an introvert and an extrovert on dealing with grief. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of difference. And you know, the, the main thing on, in finding advice for grief is to ask people what they naturally do, you know? And remember when we talked about what advice I would give, I said, well, you know, if women talk about it, then they should talk about it. And you, just to ask men, what do you like to do? What, what, what kinds of things do you like? Because usually men will go to their hobbies or to their strengths to be able to connect in with their story. And you can find out from that. Some men like to write. Some men like to, gosh, I, I, I know a guy that went and cut down a, a limb out of a tree from his childhood home and made a baseball bat out of it in honor of his brother who died. Wow. I mean, just things like that. You know, men are wonderfully diverse. And yeah, you just ask them first, get them talking about what they, what they do, what they like to do, what's, what's their interest. How do they tell their story, which is basically what you're asking, you know? Yeah, I remember you, I've heard you a number of times talk about uh, how a couple of men who don't know each other can spend the day on a boat, um, barely, you, know, the, you know, barely exchange half a dozen sentences, and by the end of the day, they're firm friends. And yes. Wonderful. Yes, and uh, that is the power of introversion, really, when you think about it. I mean, that's the power of human contact, mm -hmm. when we can just be together, just being together, doing something joint rather than having to yak, 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 yak all the time, you know? And so, by the way, I think there's more extroverts in the U.S. than there are introverts. Uh, there's certainly a cultural thing. Yes. And it's the same in Australia. Yes. Um, well, you've got to scan the neighbor, of course, an introvert, you know, they're culturally introvert, or, J or Japan, like yes. that, famously. And I think also Switzerland is more introverted. Yes. You know, yes. So, so yes. introverts in the U.S. feel a little bit left out, and uh, extroverts in Norway would probably feel. Yes. A little yes, left out. I guess, I guess. Huh. Well, it's, it's been exactly what I expected it to be. It's just a fascinating discussion. I, I, I could just listen to, to you talk for hours. Oh, gosh. So uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on this series at some point. Well, it would be an honor to come back. It's been fun today. It's been Thank good. You. Thank you. Um, and I'll have a Guinness, by the way. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Tom. Again, thank you so much. It's it, 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 it been a lot to us. You know, both Elizabeth and I are huge fans. 
as well. Oh, your work. Thank you very much, Mike. It's been great. And, and I look forward to you um, speaking at the International Conference on Men's Issues later this year. Yes. Uh, it's, still gonna, it's still a week or two off before we announce it. Um, but uh, we have exciting plans, don't we, Elizabeth? Good deal. We certainly do, yeah. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to, to, to finish with? Uh, anything to finish with? Gosh, I, I think it's just, it's been such an interesting conversation and um, I've got a lot of ideas rushing around my head at the moment. No, nothing, nothing springs to mind that I want to reveal now. There was, there was something that actually, oh, you know what? I tell you what, I was wondering if you would send me the, um, the research, Tom, about the rise in narcissism, because I'm actually writing a script at the moment for a talk called The Hidden World of Fatherhood. And so, you know, and the, any research about fathers building compassion as well would be really useful to me for that. I'll try and remember, see if Barney reminds me. If you don't get it in a couple <laughs> of days, let me know. <laughs> Good. Thank you very Good. much. Thank you, Tom. You're That's welcome. Wonderful. You, you Thank you both. And, we'll and see. Men are, and men are good. That's men the, are that, good. I meant to say that is the best name. Men for, are good. <laughs> it's the best name for a men's rights uh, website I know of. I like it. Thank you, sir. Take care. We'll see you.